Welcome again. I received a comment uh, on my channel. I want to read this comment. I watched your video about your email to Greg Laurie. I used to attend his church long ago when I was a new believer. My husband and I are now reformed and often listen to Stephen Anderson, regardless of him being a little crazy. We still like his preaching. Anyways, suicide has always made me uneasy and extremely sad for the families of those who take their lives. Are you going to post any videos regarding the suicide of Andrew Stokeline? It seems that pastors are very weary to touch on the subject, and I personally do not like when pastors say the person who committed suicide is now in heaven. I believe that these pastors need to help the families affected by their loved one's selfish act and not give them a reason to commit suicide themselves. It is wrong on so many levels. If we are saved, why then would we commit suicide? That's what these people need to ask themselves. For those of you who didn't see my video on my email to Greg Laurie, I encourage you to pause this video and go over there and watch it. There are some things that I, I say on that video that I'm not going to say here. I'm not going to repeat it. And this is uh, the context of this comment. So if you haven't seen it, please watch it. But in a nutshell, uh, the video uh, about my email to Greg Laurie started when Rick Warren's son, Matthew Warren, committed suicide. For those of you who do not know who Rick Warren is, he's the pastor of one of America's megachurches. And his, uh, his son committed suicide. What happened was Greg Laurie uh, publicly uh, got in the pulpit and uh, publicly said uh, that uh, Matthew Warren uh, is in the arms of Jesus, implying that he's in heaven now and he's in a better place, so to, so to speak. And um, that I responded to by sending Greg Laurie an email. Now, there was a long discourse uh, between me and Greg Laurie's uh, uh, correspondent. Uh, and so, um, I, again, I encourage you to watch that video if you haven't watched it. So the, the context of where I'm coming from is this. Several years ago, uh, someone who uh, was very close to me, uh, someone who actually is actually still uh, somewhat close to me, um, uh, called me one time, and, um, and uh, he sounded like he was in very bad shape. Uh, he was... Uh, uh, he was in very bad shape. Let's put it that way. And so I was talking to him on the phone for quite some time. And this is the type of guy who would never solicit attention. Okay. He would never uh, want attention from anybody. He's, he wouldn't do anything or say anything for attention. Uh, he's pretty down to earth, so to speak. And so I got the hunch that he was suicidal. And so I asked him, are you suicidal? And he said, in fact, yes. And so, you know, it's one thing for someone to be, you know, verbally saying, I, you know, verbally suicidal, because a lot of people use that as a, as a vice, as a manipulative tool to, uh, to manipulate people, to put people in fear, to manipulate them into doing things or, you know, into getting attention or sympathy or so on and so forth. So, uh, this was not the case here. So I knew it was serious. I knew it was serious that, uh, this, this particular gentleman was in fact suicidal. So what I did was I said to him, I'm going to come over to your place right away. So I went over to his place. Uh, I basically dropped everything. I went over to his place and I sat down at his dining room table face to face with him. And I, told him what I know about suicide and uh, what the scriptures say about suicide. You know, basically, to, again, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail here, um, but suicide is murder. Suicide is murdering yourself. Those who are, uh, those who did commit suicide in the, in the Bible were not in a very good place with God and I don't believe that we could expect them to be in a very good place in the life hereafter. Um, suicide is murder. Uh, the scriptures are very clear. Those who murder will not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, it says it over and over again. Okay, Suicide is murdering yourself. Uh, suicide is 
very, very selfish. You are basically cutting off yourself from God and from everybody else. You're, you're telling God, I don't care about whether or not you want to use me as a blessing for other people. All I care about is how I feel. Um, I know a lot of you people would say, well, you know, it's, it's depression, mental, um, you know, mental uh, sickness here. We got, uh, you know, some some uh, mental disease here. It's uh, some emotional, you know, it's emotional. It's it's a uh, it's a mental disorder. And so, uh, number one, I told this particular gentleman face to face what the scripture says about suicide, that you will not. You know, at least you should not expect to go to heaven if you commit suicide. And number two, I backed that up, okay? Without, okay, for those of you uh, who are listening to me right now and you say, you know, it, what you're saying is a little bit, you know, uncomfortable for me to listen to, I, I challenge you. You know, the Word of God says, do not answer a matter before you hear it, okay? Uh, if you do, it's foolishness to you. So don't be foolish. Listen Listen to me. Hear me out on this, okay? What I did was, first of all, I came at it scripturally. And I know a lot of you people would say, well, that's your, inta- that's your interpretation of scripture. But number two, I came at it from the point of view of those who firsthand went through, uh, went through it, you know, attempted suicide or actually did commit suicide and was resuscitated. And over and over and over again, I've heard testimonies who, uh, of people who have committed suicide. They flatlined. They were basically pronounced dead. And they were resuscitated later. And um, they came back to say that they were in hell. Every person that I've heard, you know, you know the scriptures say, let, let every matter be settled on the account of two or three witnesses. Okay, all we need is two, at the, you know, or three witnesses. And it's easy to find two or three witnesses of those who have attempted suicide or have committed suicide who have been clinically dead for, you know, X number of minutes or whatever and come back and say, listen, I was just in hell. Okay, it's easy to find this. It's not hard to find people who have said they've committed suicide, been brought back to life, and they've experienced hell. I have not run across one person yet that said that they've committed suicide and that they were welcomed into the arms of Jesus and Jesus was just welcome, welcoming them with a smile and they were going to heaven, you know, and seeing all those that, you know, just going into the joy of the Lord. No. Uh, hey, let's be honest here, okay? Uh, a good doctor will give you the diagnosis whether or not you like it, okay? If you have a, uh, a terminal disease, the doctor, a good doctor would tell you that. A good doctor wouldn't say, oh, go home, don't worry about it, you're fine, you know, you're healthy, when you're not healthy. So in this particular situation, we shouldn't give someone a clean bill of health, so to speak, saying that they're in heaven, they're, they're in a better place, when they're in fact not, okay? Now, don't get me wrong. Um, this is a very, very sad situation, and, and uh, we should approach this with a lot of compassion uh, and a lot of love uh, to the best of our ability or to the best that God gives us. Uh, I don't think we should be insensitive. I think we should be sensitive. I don't think that we should just pronounce, uh, you know, everybody just be just uh, cold-hearted and just say, this person's in hell, you know. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think that it's right for us to lie about it and say this person's in heaven or in a better place or in the arms of Jesus. A lie never produces good results, okay? I don't think it's good to mislead the people just to make them feel good. I don't think it's right to mislead people by giving them false information just to comfort them. Hey, like I said, a good doctor will give you a bad report if that is the truth, okay? So yeah, um, I told this particular individual uh, that I was talking to -to face-to-face what the scriptures say about suicide. I told this particular individual what others have said that have committed suicide and have come back from the dead to tell you what it, what happened, okay? And let me tell you what happened. 
It's hell. They experience hell, okay? That's just the truth, okay? And so I warn this particular individual, do not commit suicide. It's, it's you know, it's selfish at the least, it's extremely selfish. You are not taking into account anybody else's feelings. You're not taking into account that you are making someone either fatherless or brotherless or sisterless. Or, I mean, you know what I mean? You're not taking into account anybody else's feelings. You're not taking into account those who love you. You are hurting them for life. Okay. It's, it's, it's certainly a very selfish thing to do. That brings me to another point. Okay. Uh, I encourage each one of you to research, to study those who have died and have come back to talk about it. Okay. And so, you know, there are those let me give you a little bit of a, a tip here when it comes to listening to people's testimonies of, of those who have died. Um, I encourage you to listen to the testimonies of those who have been dead for several minutes, not just a few minutes, not just five minutes, but, you know, you know, several minutes, you know, uh, eight, nine, ten minutes or more and ha that have been resuscitated and come back to tell you what it's all about. And the reason why I say that is there have there are some people who have died and they say to, they go to the light. They go, you know, they, they, they go down the tunnel and they go to the light and they know that they have, uh, you know, uh, a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus and then they get sent to hell afterwards. Okay? There are those people who have said they have died and they go and see the light and then they just they get resuscitated right away without actually letting the light pronounce them, you know, uh, either to be admitted to heaven or admitted to hell, you know. Uh, so that's why I say listen to those who have been dead for, uh, or at least those who have uh, sufficient evidence or claiming at least to be dead for several minutes. But those who have committed suicide... Those who have lived a life of, of recklessness, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, all of them will tell you, right? all of the ones that I have listened to, they will tell you uh, when they died and when they were resuscitated and they come back to tell you, they will tell you that they went to hell, okay? Alcohol abuse, drug abuse leads to hell, Okay. The, the scriptures also talk about this. This is talk. This is this is um, pharmakia, which means drugs. Okay, this is not talking about the drugs that help you to become well. This is talking about recreational drugs. This is talking about you know drug abuse, because we know that according to the scriptures, it's not wrong to use true and proven medicine to help you get better. But it is wrong to abuse drugs, the pharmakia. And it says very explicitly in scripture that pharmakia, drug abuse, actually pharmakia in the scriptures sometimes is translated as sorceries. And that um, leads to hell. It says that those people who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Not inherit the kingdom of God. So... Um, you look back to when Whitney Houston passed away. Now, again, this is a very sad situation. But we got to look at this at a very... We got to be truthful about this. We got to be honest about it. Whitney Houston abused drugs. And because of that, she basically drowned. Okay? Her drug abuse led to... Uh, cardiac problems that caused her to pass out in a bathtub and she was drowned, okay? For everything that I know about Scripture and everything I know about all of the witnesses, remember, let everything be established, let everything be established by two or three witnesses. By all of the witnesses that I've heard and by what the Scriptures explicitly say, obviously, we cannot expect Whitney Houston to be in heaven. I mean, it's a very sad situation, but that's the truth. But, of course, the preachers that preached her funeral preached her right into heaven. You know, oh, Whitney Houston's in a better place or whatever, like, you know, basically saying that, that she's in heaven now. This is a great injustice 
for all who heard that message, for all who believed that message, because it's false. It's false. As far as we know, it's false. You know, uh, again, let's be truthful. A doctor, if you have a terminal disease, it would be nice for the doctor just to comfort you and say, everything's fine, you're, you're healthy, go home, don't worry about nothing. But that's not in your best interest. That's not really in your best interest. It's not in the best interest of anybody. Your best interest is to have the truth told to you. So you know what causes the disease. At least so that you would have an, so that we you would have more information to study the causes of that disease. And this is the same thing when it comes to people who have died, and these preachers say that they go to heaven. Because what happens is people who hear that message, they get the impression. At least they get the impression. Let I mean. If not, they get the, uh, I mean, they really believe that if you want to go to heaven, just commit suicide. Just commit suicide and you'll go to heaven. That's not what we should be saying at all. That's not the impression we should, give, we should be giving people at all. We should not even imply that. Even if you believe that people may go to heaven if they commit suicide, even if you call all of these witnesses liars, and I don't think it's a good thing to do. I don't think it's a good thing to, to look at all these people who say they've committed suicide and come back to tell us about it and say they've all went to hell. I don't think it's a good thing to just, just be ignorant about it and just dismiss it all as lies. Why? Why would these people lie about it? I mean, at the most, I mean, these people are honest enough to come back and say that they've failed. You know, um, I think there's a lot more people who actually experienced hell that don't talk about it. Because who, you know, if you are a child, you get F, an F on your report card. You don't want to be bragging about it or you don't want to be telling other people about it. But if you do and you're honest enough to tell other people about it, then, you know, we should listen all the more. So I'm very perplexed about this. I am very vexed about this whole situation because you got people who are committing suicide either by drug use, drug abuse, alcohol abuse. Uh, or just outright, just blatantly committing suicide. And, the, and these pastors at the funerals are saying that they're with Jesus now. That is a great injustice. That gives people all the more reason to commit suicide. And so my, my point is this, is that, you know, saying these kind of things is, is wrong, you know? You know, on the other hand, again, like I said, let's not be too insensitive. Let's not just, just uh, you know, outright just say, you know, you're all going to, you know, this person who died, uh, they're, they're in hell right now. They're burning. You know, no, no. You know, we should be compassionate about it. Yes, very compassionate. But yet, don't lie about it. Don't lie for the sake of just comforting people. A, a comforting lie never leads to a good, a good end. You are better to have... A truth that's told to you that's not very uh, pleasant, an unpleasant truth than to be told comforting lies. But I know a lot of people buy into comforting lies just because they want to be tickled. They want to have their ears tickled. They want to, you know, go away in just this facade. They want to wear a mask. They're, they want to live in hypocrisy. They want to live in a fantasy land. But that's not good. Um... And so my, my uh, point of view, my position is here, is by saying that people who have committed suicide or have died from, you know, drug use, drug abuse, is just, you know, saying that these people are in heaven now, or at least implying that they're in heaven, is just giving people all the more reason to commit suicide, you know, in one way or another. And we see this proven in Whitney Houston's case because she, you know, maybe indirectly committed suicide. Through her drug use, she basically drugged herself uh, to the point where she drowned. Um, and to say that she's in a better place or to imply it, it's just giving people all the more reason to 
follow her in her footsteps. And we see that in her own daughter. Just three and a half years later, her own daughter did exactly the same thing as Whitney Houston did, and she died too. Her daughter is a victim of this preaching. Her daughter is the victim of this ear-tickling, false preaching, false doctrine that, oh, well, you know, you can do this and you can go to heaven. Again, I'm not saying if you're, you know, I'm not saying you should just go to a funeral and preach that this person's in hell. But at least don't give people the impression that they're in heaven. At least say something that would stop other people from doing the same thing. Yes, it's very selfish. You are, you are basically saying to God, I don't want you to make me a blessing. I am refusing. I am denying you that you want to make me a blessing. I, I am denying your love of me. I am denying you. Uh, I don't care really about your feelings. I just care about my feelings. I'm in the state of depression and anxiety and, and uh, you know, uh, I'm in a bad mental state right now, so therefore I can just commit suicide. And so this whole situation about Greg Laurie um, was based upon Rick Warren's son, Matthew Warren, who committed suicide. I believe that Matthew Warren committed suicide because he grew up in this false teaching. Where's the fear of God in Rick Warren's church? You, you read about it in the book of Acts. The fear of God fell upon the church. The fear of God fell upon the church. And the fear of God came upon all the people. You read about the preaching of repentance, the preaching against sin, the preaching against the corruption of, of society. Where did Rick, how did Rick Warren ever meet that standard? It's just this very corrupted Christian gospel that has pervaded the church. And so if I were going to the church of Rick Warren, I would be asking some serious questions. And in fact, if the message was not, did not change, if the mess, if the gospel that they were preaching did not change, I'd leave the church. Now with this comment that I had here about, uh, Andrew Stokeline, um, you know, it's a very, very sad situation. It's a very heart-wrenching situation. This is a pastor of another mega church, and he committed suicide. Very sad situation for his family, for his friends. I'm, you know, I'm very, very saddened by this. I, you know, honestly, I just wish I could, uh, it, you know, my condolences to the deepest degree to to all the people that were affected. You know, first to his wife, to his children, uh, and to his friends, and to his congregation. My deepest condolences. But the the worst thing that anybody can say in this situation is that he's in heaven. Let's just, oh, please listen to me here. I've got scripture on my side. I've got witnesses on my side. I've got common sense on my side. If you tell people he's in heaven, you are giving people even more reason to do what he did. You're paving the way for this kind of tragedy to happen in other people's lives. Now, after this happened in Pastor Andrew's life, what did the leaders of his church do? Let's look at it. The Facebook post that was posted shortly after he passed away read this. Inland Hills Church, this is the church that he pastored, on August 26 at 9.14 p.m., it says, Inland Hills Church grieves with heavy hearts as our lead pastor, Andrew Stokeline, was welcomed into heaven on Saturday night after battling depression and anxiety. Okay, I, you know what? i got to stop here. The scriptures are clear. I know the, the whole idea is, you know, let's just, you know, uh, you know, let's just have sympathy here and 
let's just have great understanding here and and, and let's have great empathy toward people toward these victims that that were involved in this and let's just say it was depression and anxiety let's be clear here just like that comment said that was on my uh, on my channel if you are truly born again a new creation in Christ if the old is gone and the new has come if you are truly truly dead to sin sin has no place in your life again i'll say it over and over again but you know uh, paul made it very clear in in uh, romans chapter 6 how can you who are dead dead to sin live in it any longer you know and also in colossians paul made it very clear that the body of sin is destroyed. How can, you know, people might say, well, how do you, what do you mean? How can the body of sin be destroyed? How can you be dead to sin? Paul made it clear. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. If you're truly a Christian, if you truly have the overcoming faith, you have the faith that overcomes the sin that destroys your life. The faith is that when Jesus died, he didn't just pay for your sins like as if someone went to the store and bought something for you. No, he died so that you could relate to that, so that you can identify with that. And you can say with Paul, I am crucified with Christ. How can a dead man sin? And that's what Paul was saying in Romans chapter 6. If you're dead, how can you sin? And if you really have true faith, the faith of God, the faith of Christ, the faith of Messiah, the true Christian faith, you are crucified with Christ. And if you're crucified, how can you sin anymore? That's why John said in his epistle, you know, if you're born of God, you cannot sin. I know a lot of people that would be like, oh, what do you mean? What do you mean? That's not true. Huh? Nobody's perfect. Well, again, listen to all my teachings. I talk about this a lot. Okay. There's a great difference between perfection in the eyes of men and perfection in the eyes of God here. Perfection according to the scriptures and perfection according to people's own judgment of perfection. But that's another whole topic. I'm not going to get into that right now. But just check out my other teachings on that, about that. Um, and, and just, you know, stay, you know, stick with me here, okay? Listen, listen to the teachings that I have. All the way through my teachings, I talk about this. Uh, you know, we are, are supposed to be overcomers. It's very clear. Depression and anxiety is of the kingdom of darkness, which comes upon a person because of sin. It is a curse of sin. Read it, read it and like, you know, read Deuteronomy chapter 28. You know, the last three quarters of it. It's obvious that depression and anxiety comes from sin. And if you are redeemed, if you are dead to sin, if you are crucified with Christ, if according to uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 24, if you have crucified your sinful nature with all of its passions and desires, there's a great joy in you. A great joy in you. It is the greatest joy that anybody can have. Depression has no place in the heart of one who is truly born again. Depression has no place. I know there a lot of yeah buts, yeah buts, yeah buts come up in your mind right now. But listen to me. It's, it's just plain logic. You enter a room, you turn on the 100 watt light. D darkness has no place. Darkness has no place in light. If you live in the light, as John said, you will walk according to how Jesus walked. You think Jesus went around with, you know, depressed? And Why would he be depressed? Why would any of the disciples be depressed? The only disciple that suffered depression and anxiety was Judas. And he committed suicide too. Because of sin. And this is what I'm getting at. Sin causes depression. And depression obviously can lead to a lot of different, a lot of very tragic things. 
So, yeah, we are to have faith that overcomes sin and therefore overcome depression. One of the greatest joys that anybody could ever experience is being free from sin. And that just drives is, drives out all depression. You cannot be depressed in the light of that. Well, let's go on here to read the rest of this post here from Inland Hills Church. Okay, so it says here uh, that he was welcomed into heaven. Uh, then it says, it is, It's not the outcome we hoped and prayed for, and today we grieve as, as a church family. In his time leading Inland Hills, Andrew reached so many with his warm wit, passionate heart for God, and teaching that always, always pointed others to Jesus. The loving husband, father, son, and friend that he was will continue to inspire us in leading others into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And in this tragedy, we encourage anyone who is hurting emotionally to ask for help. If you or anyone else is struggling, the suicide prevention hotline is potentially a life-saving resource. Why, as a church of the Most High God, why would you point to a secular resource? The church is supposed to be the place that people come to for help, not the world. The, the church here is pointing to the world for help. People in the world who are suffering from depression and anxiety should go to the church and receive the same message that I gave that man. By the way, the man that I gave that message to, the man that I told that suicide leads to hell, both scripturally proving it and by many witnesses proving it to this man. By the way, that was several years ago. And by the way, he is still alive and he never even attempted suicide. Okay? Could it be that my message, or the, I should say that God's message through me, somehow woke him up, somehow put a little bit of the fear of God in him? Could it be that God's message through me to this man saved his life? Uh, all I can tell you is this man never even committed suicide, never tried to commit suicide. He's alive today. Andrew Stoklain isn't. Matthew, Matthew Warren isn't. Did Matthew, did Rick Warren ever preach this kind of message in his church and in his life to his family? And what really, really sh should shock every one of you here is the church, Inland Hills Church here, is in such bad shape. They're pointing to the world. Okay, the suicide prevention hotline is not a church, is not a faith-based organization. It is a secular, worldly organization. It reminds me of what Paul said to uh, to the church in Corinth. You, the church, you're looking for, you're looking to the world to solve your problems. You're going to court. You should be you should be solving it amongst yourself. You know you. Are, are looking to worldly judges to decide disputes between you? Shame on you is basically what Paul said to the church of Corinth. You shouldn't be looking to the, to the world. You shouldn't be looking to any secular resource because you are superior or you, you're supposed to be superior. Don't you know, as Paul said, you not only supposed to have the wisdom and the knowledge to be able to judge between between yourselves and amongst yourselves, but it says in the scriptures that God is going to give you the job, the task to judge the world. You, as the church, will be sitting in on the judgment seat, 
You'll be sitting on the judgment seat, judging the world. And Paul said, Paul even went further than that, saying, not only will you judge the world, but you will judge angels. And you, th and you can't even judge between brothers, between your own brothers in the church. You have to take it to a secular court. Shame on you. In the same way, these people cannot even find a answer within the church for depression for suicide, you have to go to a secular resource? <sighs> now, I am angry. I'm saddened on one part and I'm very angry on the other part because these people are misleading people. They're not providing the truth. We want the truth, don't we? They're not preaching the truth. They're not even providing faith that's powerful enough to overcome these kind of common things as depression or anxiety. How can you provide faith that overcomes hell? How can you overcome faith that provides the judgment of your soul to hell if you can't even provide faith that overcomes the judgment and the curse on your soul to depression and to, to be you know, suffering from anxiety? That's a curse, by the way caused by sin. I'm sure Mr. Stokeline suffered from a lot of different, let's say, struggles that no one's talking about here. Maybe his, I'm not even going to say it, but I'm sure he had a lot of struggles. The root of depression and anxiety that he suffered, if in fact it was, you know, everybody likes to blame it on depression and anxiety and everybody likes to feel sorry for people that went through this. Hey, feeling sorry is not going to cause, it's not going to cure anything, okay? We should, like I said, we should be compassionate, very compassionate. We should not be cold um, and, and cold, you know, we shouldn't be cold-hearted about this, but... We should be truthful. The truth will always set people free. Free from sin. Free from depression. The truth that I presented to this gentleman several years ago set him free from what he was under. And to this day, he remains alive without any history that I know of, of ever even attempting suicide. Why? Because I preached the fear of God to him. I preached the truth to him. Now, there's a lot of comments that follow uh, the Facebook post of Inland Hills, uh, this post that Inland Hills Church posted. And one of the comments I want to read here, one of the comments was made by a lady. And this is a comment that just, it's just very typical of people who are just very... Um, very misled by corrupt Christian doctrine today. Let me read this. I cannot believe that people are posting negativity on this thread. <laughs> Why not? I mean, people, uh, yeah, like, it's a very tragic thing that happened. And it's a very bad thing that Andrew Stokeline did here. Uh, a little bit of negativity in response, um, I think, is, is reasonable here to expect. She continued by saying, if you have nothing nice to say, don't say anything at all. Well, she should be saying that to Jesus because uh, Jesus didn't have a lot of nice things to say about a lot of people. And she said, your words of judgment and condemnation do not bring any consolation, comfort, or solace to the church or family members. Well, again, uh, it's the be-all and end-all here is not to just comfort people. The be-all and end-all is to preach the truth and to prevent this from happening in anybody else's life. She said, let God be God and let him do the judging. Again, if you read the scriptures, lady, the scriptures say that you, if, if you're truly born again, if you're truly a Christian, you will be judge over the world and judge over the angels. Okay, If you can't judge a brother in the Lord here on earth in this life, 
then what kind of a Christian will you be in the next life sitting on the judgment seat when God gives you the task to judge the world? Yeah, I'll pass a million, I'll pass a million souls before you and you're going to judge each one of them. Judge righteously, as Jesus said in John chapter 7 when he commanded his disciples to judge righteously. This lady would say, oh, not, not me, Lord, uh, not me, God. I'm not going to judge anybody. You're, you're, you're the one that's going to judge. I'm sure God's going to be angry with that. I told, I said, it's your job. Let's continue. When you get to heaven, you may, or you just may be surprised and realize that your interpretation of God's everlasting nature and unconditional love was narrow. Now, for a few things I want to say here. Number one is I would rather get to heaven and realize that God is more love, more accepting and unconditional love than I think that he is, than to go to hell and realize that God isn't as loving or unconditionally loving as I think he is. I would rather be overly cautious. I would rather be safe than sorry here. Through my experience, through years of experience here, every person that I know, every person that I know that, that talks about God's unconditional love and condemns other people for not being a vessel of God's unconditional love are actually hypocrites. These people preach unconditional love and condemn other people for not being you know, for not showing God's unconditional love. But these people who preach unconditional love, the love of Jesus and unconditional love, those these people are the first ones to block you, are the first ones to unfriend you, are the first ones to ignore you, are the first ones to cut you out of their lives. It's the truth. These are hypocrites. The first sign on the road to hypocrisy are those people who preach about who talk about God's unconditional love. I guarantee you these people don't have unconditional love or God's unconditional love. Okay, so she wrapped up by saying, if at the cross Jesus paid for our sins, past, present, and future, this sin was not included in that, in that lot. Again, this is just typical of corrupt Christian teaching. The gospel is not that Jesus somehow went to a store, went to the heavenly store and paid, you know, a fine for past, present and future sins so that your future sins are all paid for. You can just go, you can just, free, you can just be free to, to go ahead and sin because don't worry, don't worry about it. That penalty is paid for. That is heresy. Nowhere in the scriptures does it even imply that. What it does say is that you should not sin. Jesus said, go and sin no more. He didn't say, well, I understand that you're human and I have unconditional love and I understand you and, you know, just try not, just try to be good. But if you mess up, you know, you're covered. My blood covers you. He didn't say that at all. Paul never said that either. The, the apostle of grace never said that. In the book of Acts, he preached repentance hard and strong. Peter preached repentance hard and strong. He preached, come out from the world, be separate, stop sinning more or less. Paul preached to the church, warned the church, church after church after church after church. Paul warned it to the church. He warned the church, if you do sin, don't expect to, be, to go to, to, to heaven. Don't expect to inherit the kingdom of God. He warned the church, by the way. What did Jesus so-called pay on the cross? He, he give you power. Jesus didn't go to the store and pay for something for you, okay? He died so that you can die to sin. He died so that you can have power. His death gives you power to overcome sin so that you can stop sinning. Jesus' blood is not weak to not give you power over sin. 
Now I want to conclude with this. For those of you who are struggling with suicidal thoughts, the scriptures com- you know, explicitly condemn that. Condemn suicide. There's no room for suicide in the Christian's life. And I encourage you to think about what I've said here. I encourage you to listen to other people who have committed suicide and have been resuscitated to come back to warn you never to do it because hell is on the other side. You think that you are solving a problem. You think that you are getting out. It's a way out of the turmoil of this life. You think that suicide is the way out of the turmoil and stress and depression that you're experiencing in this life. When the truth is, according to the witnesses and according to Scripture, that you are just going to dive in to an ocean of turmoil that will last eternity. That's going to be a million times worse than what you're experiencing now. Don't do it. Do not do it. Listen to the rest of my teachings on how to overcome sin. Listen to these teachings and, um, you know, you will experience the overcoming life. You will overcome sin like Jesus did, like the apostles did, like the church fathers did, like the prophets of old did. And you will experience the joys of heaven like never before. So as you go and as you think about what you say, I pray that God protects you from the uh, evil spirits that could come and try to put doubts in your mind, try to take the seed of the word that I planted in you, in your, in your mind, in your life. And I pray that light and life will come to you by my teaching and by this video and that you will experience the joy of the Lord in this life and in the next life. May the Lord bless you and keep you cause his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you, lift up his face upon you, and give you wonderful, wonderful shalom peace.